So P Peter and, uh, and, and, and Riyadh here are mentioning a very critical point over here, which is, again, uh, all related to the endpoints. And interestingly, there are truly uh, two schools of thoughts at the moment, at least. Uh, one of them is, if I'm having therapy X, whatever that is, and if for whatever reason it's influenced, uh, uh, the survivor is influenced by therapy Y that is to follow X, uh, then you wonder, is it really survival due to X per se? That's one school of thought, and I think Riyadh nicely presented that per se. On the other hand, there's another school of thought. If a patient was on X and they go to Y, and let's say survival is extended further, and now, wait a minute, like what's X contribution here? How can I tell? Interestingly, the argument is given, a patient who ended up going to Y, they didn't do going to Y, they did not succeed in going to Y, except because they got X. I.e., it's not really that we are looking at therapies as isolation one from the other. They really are looked as a continuum per se. And these two schools of thought are gonna go back and forth all the time. But I would say until that day comes, uh, still uh, looking at survival is really the uh, uh, ultimate uh, reference points for us. Uh, and as such, for example, while we're discussing local therapy, uh, if, for example, we embolize a tumor in the liver and let's say something happened to a, or, or a new tumor emerged in the lung, technically it is part of the uh, process and it's not like something independent and this is where the TTUP come into play, what have we. So it's kind of a little bit of a debate now, but at least it's gonna come not necessarily only in uh, liver cancer, but in many other cancers. But for now, still, we look at things as being not independent in one view, and at the same time, survival is really understood still as being the ultimate endpoint. Because before we end up on the local therapy, I have one last question to really bring into a conclusion to all of that. And Riyadh mentioned, uh, Amit, in regard to the uh, uh, decision-making and planning and sequencing of the uh, embolization. And if you recall, there was the Optimist study, which was at ASCO, and we are gonna hear again about the Optimist study at ESMO. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit more about what, what's Optimist? Yeah, so Optimist is a multinational observational study looking at local regional therapies and how they're used in practice. And I think that there's a couple key points that you can take away from this um, observational study. The first is that TACE is used in many patients in whom it's not typically recommended. Um, you know, so patients, for example, with more advanced tumor burden in whom that at most centers we would not be treating with chemoembolization. Um, and then the second thing is that what you see is that even after you have progression, and this gets to what Peter was talking about prior in terms of actually figuring out when you would get off that track and, and go to sequential therapy, we see people who receive multiple TASES and potentially more than they should. And when you take a look at the data from Optimus, what you start to see is a couple trends. The more TASES you receive, the less likely it is that you're going to have a response. And each of these TASES is associated with the risk of liver dysfunction. And so you can argue that the value, this risk benefit ratio changes over time and so you, you really have to reassess and say after each chemoembolization, what's the response? How is the patient tolerating it? And is it the appropriate time for me to move to systemic therapy? And I think that's really one of the key things, particularly as we'll talk about, we have more and more options that provide good benefit for systemic therapy. I think we really need to define when is that optimal time to move to systemic therapy so we can get the maximal benefit from local regional therapy and the maximal benefit from systemic therapy. That's a great point. Actually, if anything, it will be a great transition regard to talking about systemic therapy. And I go back to Riyadh about the point. Considering that you are an interventional radiologist, from your own perspective as an interventional radiologist, and also what do you hear from patients? When do you think patients should move from local therapy to systemic in your own perception? And at the same time, we're curious, do patients tell you, maybe I should go look into systemic therapy? Well, that's a great real life uh, scenario that you present as, as Peter was mentioning. The reality is when I meet with patients, all of these things come into play. And, and it's my belief that I actually think the combination therapy should be closer together rather than farther. So there are data, and we've written on this before, that if you do a local therapy and you wait until patients progress, about half of them have decompensated uh, liver dysfunction because of natural progression, because of disease progression, and because of potentially uh, treatment toxicity. My belief is the optimal, although this is not uh, uh, evidence-based, the optimal thing to do is to do a local regional therapy 
and at day 30 or 60 implement the systemic therapy because they still have good liver function, they still have uh, a good performance status, and you, they can tolerate the benefit of the two. If you wait too long, this is why there's dropout. That's, not, that's why not all patients that progress on local regional therapies go to a systemic drug because they can't tolerate it. So I think the ideal world is a, is a local therapy and then a systemic therapy. Even in, in patients where there's no systemic disease, uh, uh, with sort of bulky disease, I think that's the optimal combination. So I don't believe in waiting that long. That's my personal opinion. Uh, and uh, and uh, it'd be interesting to do a study like that, but we've done some retrospective analyses that support this position. Because if you wait too long, then you're not going to tolerate that.